Covenant Church has been rooted in the North Park, San Diego neighborhood for over 70 years. And we believe that God is restoring his creation and renewing lives in our church, our neighborhood, our city, and cultures around the world for his glory. My name is Patrick, and I'm the lead pastor here, and I'd personally love to invite you to join us Sunday at 10 a.m. in North Park at the corner of Howard and 30th. Thanks. Good morning and uh, welcome to Covenant. It's great to gather with you all today. Uh, my name is Patrick. If we haven't had a chance to meet, if you're a guest, a uh, special welcome to you today. You know, our call to worship today from Psalm 103 talks about praising God. And what is, what is the catalyst? What's the motivation to praise God? Well, the psalm says that we think about his benefits towards us, that he forgives us, that he redeems us. It also talks about thinking of his character. It says that God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. So I don't know as you come in today how you're thinking about God. But he is the one who's gracious and compassionate and he's abounding in love to you. So let's stand, if you would, right now as we read our call to worship. And let these words from Psalm 103 motivate us, stir us to praise God. Please join aloud in the all section. Peace be with you. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins. And heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Father, we gather here today to, to praise you. And Lord, some of us as we've come into this space, we're really leaning forward into that. We're remembering well your benefits and your character. Lord, for others, we're coming in here weary or maybe even doubting. Lord, would you help us to see for the first time or to see it again, your benefits towards us. You are a God who forgives. You are a God who heals. You are a God who redeems. Lord, change our vision of you if it is skewed. You are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. I pray in heart, in mind, in body, and soul, you'd fix our attention on you and help us to praise you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, worship. 
God, as Patrick was saying, you know, in the Old Testament, we're told that God is actually singing over his people. Uh, that if you are uh, in faith in Christ, that God sings over you. Um, and so when you, this first verse is talking about turning your ear to heaven and hearing that noise. And imagine that God himself and the angels sing over us this morning. So let's praise him for those things. Turn your ear to heaven and hear the noise inside the sound of angels are the sound of angels songs and all this for the king we could join
Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, a sin day of many, His mercy is more. Father, we do uh, give thanks that our sins, they are many. 
the sins that we, we fail to do good things and the things that we think inside. Lord, our sins, they are many, but your mercy is more. The, the darkness is strong, but you are stronger. Praise be to Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, as we come into this time of, of confession that we do every week, it is, it's okay and it's, it's freeing in some ways to say that the darkness can be strong out there and in here and things can be broken out there and in here. And this is a time of honesty where we say our sins, they are many. The things that we do and the things that we fail to do. And yet we say the darkness is strong, but God is stronger. And our sins, they are many, but his mercy is so much more. As the song we just sang says, they are at the bottom of the shore, and the Father, or at the bottom of the sea, and the Father comes to us with open arms. So come to this prayer of confession time with that posture. I invite you to read over the confession on your own. It'll be on the screen. It's in your worship handout. Just take a moment to read over that, pray over that. Kind of make it your own in your heart and we'll pray it aloud together. Let's pray this aloud together, remembering his mercy is more. Gracious Father, we confess that we have longed too much for the comforts and treasures of this world rather than for your enduring kingdom. We have loved the gifts more than the giver. In your mercy, help us to see that the things we strive for are shadows, but you are the substance. They are quicksand. You are a mighty rock. They are shifting, but you are an anchor. Thank you for forgiving us through the riches of Christ and freeing us to live a new life, faithfully devoted to him. In Jesus' name, amen. Take about 30 seconds now just to be with the Lord on your own, bringing your own concerns and looking to his mercy. Hear Jesus now speak these words over you. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, thank you that when we come to you in honesty about who we are, Lord, we don't find you with a clenched fist crossed arms, a stern face, we find you gentle and humble in heart. You say to us, come to me with your burdens, come to me with your weariness and your darkness and your brokenness and find rest. So Jesus, by grace through faith, we take comfort in the rest you offer. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to rise from your seats now as we declare the Apostles' Creed. You know, everyone lives by a story. And this is the story the church has been telling from the beginning. The story of Jesus and his rescue towards us. Let's declare these words together, the essentials of our Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Worship, for we have a great rescuer in Jesus. Let's sing, he's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There is good news for the captive. Good news for the shame. fails for the good God, we thank you that you give to us something that we could never earn, uh, something that we cannot afford to pay. Um, and God, you come down to us and you rescue us. Even when we think we don't need rescuing, you make the first move that you come into this world. You give us your grace. You give us your mercy. And by Jesus, you have rescued us not only from the uh, power of sin in our lives, but the penalty of sin, which Jesus has taken in our place on the cross, and that with his death and his resurrection, he has given us hope for today. He's giving us a living mercy uh, that we can walk into day by day. And so we thank you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at this time, uh, kids... Um, Elementary and middle school are dismissed. Uh, the rest of you, please take some moments to refresh a coffee, say good morning to one another for the next five minutes, and then we'll come back together.
Feel free to finish up those handshakes and hugs and how you doings, and go ahead and grab your seats. Um, again, if you are a guest this morning and you're, you're newish, we're so glad that you are here. We have a, a weekly email newsletter that goes out, just kind of more information of what's happening in the life of our church. And so uh, you can find information in the back of your worship handout that will tell you more and how to, how to get connected to that, a QR code. encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, and just also just want to thank you for the generosity of this church, uh, just the way that you partner financially to help this church be an outpost of hope on the corner of Howard and 30th, grateful for that. If Covenant is becoming your church, feel free to participate in different ways through giving there. I want to invite Michael up wherever, wherever he is, back in the cast. Let's give Michael a hand, playing through pain. <laughs> thank you, yeah. I only wear this for sympathy. <laughs> and so you'll come and volunteer at music camp this week. Uh, that's what I'm giving the announcement for. Um, the long-awaited music camp is beginning tomorrow. Uh, so we're excited that this is going to be happening Monday through Friday from 9 until 2 o'clock. Um, and is Grace around? And is, Did Stacy make it? No. Well, I want to acknowledge Grace because Grace has done a ton of hard work for this camp. Yeah, I'd like to give her a little round of applause. Without Grace, it, it, this really would not be happening this week. And so um, she's done a wonderful job and it's been amazing to partner with her. Um, I think we still could use a couple of volunteer positions if you're available either all week or any day uh, this week. Uh, whether it's, you know, helping with check-in or just, you know, set up and some tear-down at the end of the day. Um, we've got our teachers all covered. We've got, um, I think we could use some help with activities, right? Yeah, maybe something like that. I have to ask her because really she should be up here giving the announcement. But, uh, but they're very thankful for it. Um, we would ask that you'd cover it in prayer. Um, and there are still spots open for registration. So, if you know of anybody who's trying to make a last-minute decision um, or if they just want to check it out tomorrow, uh, they're welcome to come, okay? So uh, sign-ups, uh, yeah, we're not sign-ups. Yeah, sign-up table will be open at 8.50 a.m., so 10 to 9 tomorrow morning. Thanks. Oh, yeah. That's great. Uh, so just be in prayer for that, that camp coming up this, uh, this week. Also, on the back of your worship handout, you can see a couple other announcements, info, about the Covenant camping trip happening at the end of, of September. Uh, a great time to connect with folks and have more space to kind of dialogue and connect. Also, if you uh, would like to serve in some way on Sunday mornings, there's lots of ways for you to participate, whether it's teaching in the kids' classes or helping with food or coffee or, or greeting or if you have a, a musical bone in your body, I'm sure Michael would like to get to know you and have you participate. So take advantage of that. There's information about who to connect with uh, to serve. You know, this is a time in our church now where we come to a prayer time we call Prayers of the People, and it's a chance for us to pray for our world, our nation, our city, our church, um, and so as we think about those things, I was uh, thinking this morning about the global church. And, and the, did you know that one in seven Christians around the world live in a situation where they are highly persecuted and, discrim and, and discriminated against? 360 million Christians around the world uh, struggle to gather freely, and so we want to be praying for them. As we think about our nation, we want to pray for our leaders for compassion and for humility and conviction. Uh, as we think about our city, you know, just yesterday there was close to, I believe, 600 people. Where's Abby? 600 people for the day of service for Hope for San Diego. So just pray for the fruit of that, that that salt and light witness in the city would, would bear fruit and people would experience the mercy of Jesus. And also for our local church here, pray for the music camp, that, that students would experience the creativity and the beauty of God as they learn more about music. So as I pray about these things, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and we respond, hear our prayer. And so, Father, we, we gather at this time as a people, and we want to pray for the world, for our nation, our city, our church. Lord, we're mindful as, as we gather here freely, that is not the story for many fellow brothers and sisters around, around the world. So, Lord, those who are gathering to worship underground, or underneath difficult or persecuted situations. Lord, we pray for their encouragement, for their perseverance, for their strength. 
Lord, somehow throughout history when your church is, is persecuted and pushed down, we see that in the New Testament times, Lord, it flourishes. So, Lord, we pray that you would, you would grow your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our nation, we pray for our leaders, for our president, for our governor, for our mayor, for our elected officials. Lord, for compassion, for humility, for wisdom as they lead our country. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for our city. Lord, we thank you for so many out in North County and in the city and South County and East, Lord, serving in the uh, Hope for San Diego Day of Service. Lord, I pray that the the hands and feet, the, the mercy given, the the salt and light experienced by our city would, would bear fruit. Lord, that those who are distant from you might have experienced you in a physical, tangible way for the first time. Lord, you would bear fruit in those, those acts of mercy. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, finally, we pray for our local church in this day, this week of music camp coming up. God, you are a creative God. A God of music, a God of beauty. And so as these students gather this week to learn music and to build relationships, Lord, may they in direct and indirect ways experience the God of beauty and creativity and wonder and know that they are creatively and wonderfully made as they uh, seek to make a joyful noise. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Invite Matt Chang up to read our scripture this morning. Good morning. Uh, This morning's scripture is Psalm 86. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord, my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. Arrogant foes are attacking me, O God. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. They have no regard for you, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength in behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you just as my mother did. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Matt and Patrick, for leading us in worship. My name's Kennerly, and I'm a pastor here at Covenant. This summer, we've been working through and uh, enjoying praying with the Psalms as our sermon series. And this morning, Psalm 86, that we just heard read, we're talking about a prayer for patient endurance. And this morning, I want us to consider a question. The question is, what do you want? It's actually a foundational question for Christian discipleship from beginning to end. It's it's the first question that Jesus asked two of his disciples when they first started to follow him in the Gospel of John. What do you want? It's also the question that God asked Solomon, the son of David, after he had become king of Israel. Ask for whatever you want me to give to you. So what do you want? We all have an answer, and our answer actually reveals what we consider to be the good life, what we want most of all, what we can't live without. Because what we want, we will sacrifice for, we will make time for, we will put energy into, and it's because it's our reason for living. It's our hope. 
the French author Antoine du Saint Exupery, he's known for writing The Little Prince. He advised, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood, and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. And that's what Psalm 86 does for us. It builds in us patient endurance by teaching us to long for the endless immensity of God, who is our only hope in life and in death. And this psalm is a prayer from David, a shepherd boy who defeated Goliath and then later became a great king of Israel. He was not perfect, but he loved God. And his prayer that we just heard read teaches us to want God with our attention, with our praise, and with patient endurance. So first, we're called to pay attention. So once a month, I usually teach our elementary kids class during this time of the service. And after we play and pray, we usually gather up and we will get a Bible and each get a Bible and we look for our passage and read it together. And I usually start that time by asking the students, what does this passage teach us or show us about God? And it's actually the right place to start for this psalm because this psalm is completely focused on God, who he is, what he has done, what he can do. David's prayer shows us the immensity of God by fixing our attention on God. And we, play, we pay attention from a place of humility. There is a striking contrast between what we learn about David from this psalm and what we learn about God. Because if you notice in the passage, and you can mark it if that helps you follow along, but according to this psalm, we know that God listens, we know that he answers, he guards and saves, he brings joy, he is forgiving and good, abounding in love, there's no one like him, he's great, he does marvelous deeds, he teaches, he loves, he delivers. He is compassionate, he is gracious, he's slow to anger. He's abounding in love and faithfulness. He helps, he comforts. And what we know about David is entirely in, con in uh, connection and relationship and response to the character of God. David is poor and needy before God. He's faithful and trusting in God. He's calling out to God. He's looking for God's help and comfort. It's only in verse 14 that we get a bit of a, some detail as to David's really distressing situation. Arrogant, ruthless people are trying to kill David. So think, consider, how would you pray if verse 14 was your reality? Because we too live in a world that has little regard for God. And I know my tendency would be to jump right to verse 14 and to start there and to provide a whole lot more prayer and detail about the situation that I was experiencing. I would want to cover all those details in prayer exhaustively, but David spotlights God and God's marvelous deeds. As we hear Psalm 86, as we just did, we're far more impressed with God than we are with David's situation. We know more about God than we do about David's situation. And this should be true of our praying as well. Joni Erickson Tata, a woman who has faced challenging circumstances, she was paralyzed from her neck down at the age of 17 from a diving accident. And she wrote that in her art studio, she said, I keep a little plaque that reads, don't tell God that you have a big problem. Tell your problem that you have a big God. Do you have a problem that is screaming for your undivided attention, insisting that you idealize it? Friend, tell that problem that your God is immeasurably bigger than it is. Declare over your situation, Deuteronomy 4.35, the Lord, he is God. There is no other beside him. Because even in prayer, our attention can be misplaced. So we look to God from a place of humility, not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. 
And not ignoring our circumstances and not minimizing our circumstances, but holding them in perspective before the one who guards our lives, who can bring us joy, and who will answer us. And this is the work of God's Spirit, giving us eyes to see God's goodness. David can face what is happening in his life in verse 14 because his attention is fixed on the truth of verse 13. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. So David is certain of his future deliverance from the power of death. Not just the sting of physical death, but of a deeper abyss. We all face the shadow of death. But it's the second, the spiritual death that David is referring to here as the depths, the realm of the dead. David has full assurance that he has already been delivered because, as he says in verse 2, he trusts in God. And this salvation hope is what enables David to keep his present circumstances as terrible as they are. In verse 14, in perspective, how much more can we have David's depth of confidence on this side of the cross? Because great is God's love for us in Jesus, that while we were still his enemies, he loved us. He descended into the depths, the realm of the dead, to free us and deliver us from the guilt and the punishment of our sin. Jesus faced arrogant foes throughout his ministry. People were trying to kill him and shouted, crucify him. He was beaten and nailed to a cross with no regard. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is God's love for us. And until this captivates our attention, we won't know what we want in life. As we live in an attention economy where our phones and our work and our hobbies are all vying for our attention, and what we pay attention to will shape us, and what we want we will pay attention to. And David calls out to God all day long. God has his attention all day long because he knows that God will answer. And we too can call out to God anytime, anywhere, knowing that he hears us and he will answer. So we need to pray to God. We need to make it a rhythm. Like we have this morning, a weekly rhythm where we are gathering each, with each other to pray. We need to make it a daily rhythm where we are drawing our attention to God. A friend of mine, who is actually a mutual friend of ours by the name of Kathy Probesius, uh, she swims for exercise. And as she swims laps, and some of you may know this, she goes through the alphabet, giving an attribute and character, characteristic of God to each letter of the alphabet. So. Almighty God, you are beautiful, you are the creator. And she goes all the way to exalted, there's a little flexibility there, <laughs> and Yahweh and zealous, and if you get stuck on a letter, see Kathy. But while she's swimming laps, she is fixing her attention on God in a daily rhythm, in a daily practice. Some of you may be familiar with the acts acronym as a guide to prayer, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. If that's helpful to you, use it. Do it. When you sit down for a meal, pray that way. Maybe you can read and pray through a psalm each day, praying through it, making it your own, your own words to God and hearing God's word to you. We're called to fix our attention on God. There's so many ways to do it, but we need to do it. Because what we pay attention to will shape us. And what we want, we will pay attention to. So as we pay attention to God, we are also called to praise. Every Sunday, hopefully you all notice this, but every Sunday we start our service with a call to worship. Our attention is called into focus before the Lord, and that naturally leads us to worship. And Psalm 86 follows that same movement. Our attention is fixed on God, which leads to praise. And there are exclamations of praise in this psalm. Verses 5, 10, and 15 
which I think is so graciously easy to remember, are all exclamations of praise. There's a flourish of praise in verses 8 through 10. David doesn't just give God his attention. He marvels at God. There's nothing that can compare to the Lord. David piles on layers of praise, starting in verse 8. There is no one like God in the heavens. He is God of the angel armies. There are no deeds or works in creation that can compare with what God has done. He is the creator and the sustainer of all things. Galaxies and ant colonies are his handiwork. David envisions the glory of God's throne in heaven, surrounded by people from every nation, tribe, and language, praising God because he alone is worthy of all our allegiance, all, his, all our glory that we can give, all our praise. And then David shows us the immensity of God with his praise. And praise stretches our praying imagination. It gives us new angles to marvel at God's goodness. But don't miss the context of David's praise in verse 7. He praises God in the midst of his distress. And then in verse 12, David is deliberate about his praise. I will praise you. I will glorify your name. For David, praise is a matter of deliberate delight. He wants God with all his heart, but then he also cultivates a habit of praise to encourage his heart to want God alone. And I think we experience this spiritual reality and discipline in our physical sense of taste. And I don't know if you've ever acquired a taste for something, but think of a cup of coffee in the morning. You, you drink it. And then you start to drink it more. And all of a sudden, you've gone from uh, maybe not loving it at the first sip of your life to enjoying it, to wanting it more, to the point where we are desperately in need of a cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> On a far more profound level, we're invited to taste and see God's goodness, to hunger and thirst after his righteousness. So deliberately delight in praising God. Memorize verse 10 or verse 13 here in this psalm. Pray these verses as we're getting ready in the morning or as we're going to bed. We need to cultivate a habit of praise, deliberately delighting in God. So David has fixed his attention on God, and he has been deliberate in his praise and delight of God. And this turns now into a prayer for patient endurance. In verse 11, David prays, teach me your way, Lord. Give me an undivided heart. This is a, a prayer for forming the right habits rather than making the right moves. The type of teaching that David is talking about is not a matter of information. It's a request for formation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's one thing to be guided to the way. It's another thing to be guided in the way. And the Lord teaches and guides us by giving us his hand. He gives us his word. He enables us by his spirit to understand and to obey. So we walk with him in his way. And David understood what Proverbs makes clear that wisdom is trusting in the Lord with all your heart and not leaning on your own understanding. So David asks for an undivided heart. He needed God to give him this deep, singular desire and joy in God. He doesn't well up his might and strength and effort for this. He asks. God has to give it. It is a gift that David wants to receive and God wants to give. And for what? In verse 11, why does David ask for this? David wants to be formed by God's word and he wants to walk in God's way so that he may rely on God and fear his name. We typically think of learning and formation as leading to independence, right? We learn to walk, to read, to drive, to swim so that we can do it by ourselves. But spiritual maturity, this growing and this teaching and this walking leads us closer and deeper to the heart of God. David does not grow up 
from being poor and needy in verse 1. Formation in Christ strengthens our reliance on Christ, keeping us steadfast in the midst of life's storms like an anchor. So in the midst of distressing circumstances, David wants God to act. David will praise, he will glorify, he will serve God, but he looks to God's strength and saving, not his own. Notice in the last verse, the change in tense, for those of you who like grammar. This will be extra exciting. <laughs> uh, but the Lord, he says, for you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. We don't know of any actual change in David's circumstances and situation, but he is so confident in God's help and in God's comfort that he can speak of it in past tense. It's as though it's already happened. David can be patient with his circumstances because he's so confident that God will act and has already delivered him from the realm of the dead, that he can wait. Think about who David is. He's known as this great shepherd, a warrior, a king. He's fought bears, lions, a giant soldier named Goliath. David, who has slain his tens of thousands, and he wants to see God's strength. And this is the power of patient endurance. It, he's not rushing in past God. He's not taking matters into his own hands, but he's trusting in God to act. David does not trust in his own strength, but he trusts in the Lord's. The only contribution that David makes is his service or obedience to God. His resume is that he serves the Lord just as his mother did. This patient endurance that we see here is not situational. It's not just powering through this one situation in verse 14. It's generational. Of all the impressive claims that David could have made about why God should save him, it's a legacy of obedience that counts. Patient endurance passed on from one spiritual generation to the next. We don't know much about David's mother. But what David says here is all we could want said of us, that we serve the Lord. The relational impact of patient endurance makes me think of a friend of mine, Christy Napier, who I met while attending a church in Arizona. She, at the time, had two teenage kids, married, mother of two kids, who are now grown. In the summer of 2007, scar tissue sort of mysteriously began growing over her trachea and around her vocal cords. And so one night, she was unaware of what was happening, but one night she woke up gasping for breath and could not breathe. So her husband rushed her to the hospital where doctors there put her on a ventilator and then ended up having to cut a hole through her throat for a direct passageway for her, airs, for her airway. Four years later, doctors still couldn't figure out why this was mysteriously happening and continuing to happen. After 40 surgeries, Christy stopped keeping track and counting, but she continued to undergo surgery and radiation to combat the scar tissue from growing over and uh, surrounding her trachea and her vocal cords. So in the midst of her difficult health situation, Christy illustrated for me what patient endurance looks like, and it has continued to be an encouragement to me. Christy shared with me through an email that after about a year into struggling with her health, she had cried out to the Lord. She cried out, I just need this to end. And he spoke into her heart in response, you don't need this to end. You just need me. Christy said then, this wonderful wave of freedom broke over me, realizing I need never to panic. I was never desperate. I don't need certain circumstances to have the peace and rest and loving service in the Lord that I so deeply desire. I just need God. I hadn't had great health or good breathing or virtually even a month free with no surgery over this past year. And yet, it has been a happy, 
prosperous, joyful, peaceful, growing, and blessed year. I am learning I don't need the most, not even more breath or health. I can find rest and beauty in the least because that makes more room for God, who really is the most. That is a truly fine treasure of discovery in the darkness. Several years after realizing this truth and writing this email, and after many more surgeries, Christy's doctors were able to use experimental treatment and were able to help stop and prevent the continuing growth of the scar tissue. And as she regained health through this process, she also gained a far richer understanding of God's hope, of the hope that we can have in God. Our patient endurance boldly declares what we want most. And it declares that to a watching world. It declares that to those who are around us, some of the times those who are closest to us. So as we daily pay attention to God and praise him with deliberate delight, and patiently endure, we are faithfully serving our God. We are proclaiming what we want most of all, and that the Lord is what we want. This psalm is a helpful picture of discipleship, of the good life in Christ. And David's attention is fixed on the Lord, and he will praise God. He will patiently endure, because he has what he wants. The Lord forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on him. And this Lord is the one that we get to celebrate at the Lord's table. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup in the new covenant in my blood, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pray with me. Lord, you are great and do marvelous deeds. You are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on you. We taste and see your love as we remember your work on the cross in the bread and in the cup. Teach us to do your will through all wisdom and understanding that your spirit gives so that we may live lives worthy and pleasing to you in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in knowledge of you, being strengthened with all power according to your glorious might so that we may have patient endurance, giving joyful thanks to you, Father, because you have made us your holy people. And as you taught your disciples to pray, and as your people, Lord, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. This morning we, have three, we will have three serving stations, one for each section of the pews. I'm going to invite you, when you're ready to uh, leave your pew section, the right, to your right. It is this way, my left, so your right, and then come forward, and then you can return to your seat on the left. I invite you to rise and to come, to taste and see God's goodness by grace through faith in Jesus.
singing of the great hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Christ, my living hope, sing hallelujah. 
Go now with the Lord's blessing. Go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.